Good afternoon. Thank you very much for coming to the workshop on dangerous liaison brainstorming the 21st century academic library liaison. My name is Angie Mays. I'm the director of collections at the University of Kentucky. And I would like to welcome you to this hybrid between a starting presentation and lots of interactive activities. And for those of you who teach information literacy, we all know what a challenge it is to pack everything into 75 minutes. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. But first, we're going to do a series of live polls does everyone have a smartphone or something you can get online with to participate in the online live poll? If not, I'll pass around a notepad so that you can participate and write your notes, and I will incorporate those in the final write-up of the results from today's sessions. So let's have a show of hands. Who has a device to participate in a simple poll? Okay, all right, so it looks like we're very close. Behind the, podium the whole time. Can you all hear me? Can you hear me without the mic? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So if the moving around gets too awkward, I might re go back to without the mic. So how many of you are liaisons? Okay. So and most of you. How many of you have colleagues who are liaisons? Okay. So you're all exposed to the liaison roles in a direct way. In a direct way or indirect way. So about this session, I'm going to start out with a very brief overview of the research. These slides are already online on the conference website. And this URL at the bottom is where I'm going to post the preliminary compilation of today's materials that we're, gout, that we're generating today so that, so that if you have difficulty seeing the slides or if they don't photograph well from an angle, don't worry about it. They're already online. So we'll cover a little bit about current issues and I recently went to a library liaison institute at the Association of Southeastern Research Libraries and there were some interesting findings com coming out of that and at, afterwards we'll do some exercises. I found some job descriptions that include liaison roles. Because we're not all ARL libraries, I chose job descriptions for a, from a variety of different libraries of diff varying sizes, including one corporate library that had a very interesting, well thought out description of the liaison role. And I will just pass those sheets around and give you some time to work on those. And then we're going to have an unconference style series of interactive live polls that you can participate in because in 75 minutes, that's a much more efficient way of gathering our information because in a room like this, no one has time to report out. If you like, if you like, I will email you the results. Then if you'd rather wait, then I will post them on the website. So, so the library liaison roots were in the subject bibliographer in decades ago, 
and the subject focus was largely from the acquisitions tradition. And then another subject focus was in reference and instruction. But as we all know, this role has evolved over time with the growth of information literacy as the volume of published material has continued to grow and online likenesses, online publications and online access has made it much easier for students to do online research. It's also created the challenge of students wading through materials without a sense of where to go. And so that has led to the rise of information literacy to help students in a structured way. And those roles have not evolved separately. So in some libraries, we have acquisitions librarians who are also teaching classes. And if they have a background knowledge in a certain subject area, they become the de facto liaison for that subject area. And depending on how complex that subject area is, they could essentially be working two jobs rolled into one in terms of the amount of time that their roles, dual roles, would take up. And if the program happens to be growing and diversifying on the university campus, then that adds more and more to that one person. And then it also becomes harder to evaluate because an acquisitions person or a collection management librarian might be in one, in one administrative area of the library where the instruction part might live in a different administrative unit in the library. And oftentimes those roles are divided up between technical services, public services, or divisions by similar names. And, that's, and that has created some friction points as in As in, how do you, as in, how do you balance the roles in between where do these pieces of the role and the liaison duties live? And how best to balance them, both in terms of jurisdiction, how to evaluate them, and how to make sure that we don't have one person doing four, four jobs worth of work and other people maybe doing one or two people's worth of work. So balance, balancing the load and balancing the administrative roles of evaluating the work becomes a challenge. And so the subject expertise is typically, is typically derived from another graduate degree or maybe having had prior work, prior experience. I apologize. <laughs> I hope this records in the way that people trying to view the session later can hear. So the subject expertise could be that someone brings knowledge from having worked in that field. And then does, does this mean background knowledge, collection development? How do you deploy the collection in teaching and providing access, you really have to have a degree of knowledge and familiarity with what's in the library in order to lead students to that material. And then the different expertise is vendor knowledge and who is a good supplier for what kinds of materials. If you're in a place that teaches a lot of different languages, we all know that there is no one-stop shopping for everything that your programs might need. Some vendors might be better for engineering materials, others might be better for business materials, or by geographic regions, so there's that expertise. And over time, all these work areas have bled over into each other, and so it's caused a task creep, and it also becomes a time challenge. How do you schedule it all and keep it straight and still get your work done in a timely fashion? And at the institute that I attended at the Association of Southeastern Research Libraries, there was a session that included 
librarians' own perspectives, and those were all research libraries, but some of the findings apply to all types of libraries, so it still has relevance. <clears throat> and that was also a mix of a keynote with a major review of literature and interactive <laughs> exercises and table talks. That was over that was over two days, so they, there was more time than we have today. Let's see if this works. Okay. So there are a lot of different changes, and as the digital ecosystem has expanded greatly, the nature of research has changed, teaching has changed, and learning has changed. Not only how we use the materials, the breadth and range of materials available, but how students approach it, and also how faculty researchers approach the materials. And that needs a different kind of interaction between the library and these different constituencies. Then universities, especially among research libraries, but I've also seen this growing more and more among smaller organizations is that there's more international collaborations and that also creates different workflows for the libraries. Much more collaboration. Each institution becomes more interdependent with others as opposed to just an island. We're this one college and this is what we teach for our local community. But there's a growing expectation that there will be interaction with other institutions. Then there was also a lot of discussion about the 21st century information professional. It's not print-based. It's no longer routine tasks. There's a lot more customer service and customer relation management in the fluid evolution of the liaison's tasks. But then some external customers of the library see that libraries and the liaison approaches are a little outdated in that some feel very comfortable with just doing what they've been doing for decades. And then they cling to their own program areas and that's all they take on. Maybe they don't want to do anything else but be a bibliographer or they want to teach and they don't want to deal with collection development depending on which traditional side they started out with. And they also look at it from the standpoint of, well, I'm doing this, this is my job description, and I'm feeding out. Instead of going out to the constituencies, the faculty, students, and program administrators to see what those programs need now, and, and there's also a little fear about being creative and just trying something new. Some people aren't comfortable with that. And it creates challenges. And so one way of tackling that is to partner across campus. And depending on the kinds of institution that you have, if you're in a research library, you could partner with the research office or institutional research for assessment to see where the student needs are. And you could also look at centers of excellence. Every college and university has an office that supports teaching and learning principles for faculty. So libraries are a natural partner for collaborating with those offices across the entire campus beyond the traditional lines of the library working together with particular faculty members in an assigned program. And there was also a lot of discussion at the Institute that knowing when to do something is as important as knowing what to do. And this timing can only happen if there's an ongoing relationship of just going out across campus and having a lot of conversations. And this doesn't necessarily have to be in meetings, which no one has time for meeting 
spending a lot of time every day meeting, but these conversations can be by email, or if you're at a faculty meeting and you get into a conversation, there are informal ways and formal ways to gather information. And that gives you a sense of what the needs are, and then you observe a gap in student knowledge, and you have a much better sense of what is needed. So there are some pain points, outreach. A lot of universities are making an effort to increase student success and increase retention rates. And there is a lot of research about why students are dropping out. Is it an intellectual issue? Is it an intellectual mismatch? Is it financial? Depending on the student body, the answers could very widely, or do you have a lot of in international students that have language barriers that are so great that they create impediments to learning because the language just isn't quite enough to help the students absorb that college level knowledge? What is it? And what does the university need? Is there a push to bring in more international students and engage them? Some international students come from countries with libraries that have closed stacks. They've never seen an open stack system. What does that mean for teaching? And I, and I see some people smiling, so it sounds like some of you have seen that. And what are you seeing? Are the students so overwhelmed by the huge glut of information that's out there that they're skimming the surface and not delving deeply enough into their subjects to write a high-quality, well-reasoned, college-level paper? And what is it? And how do we know? Through, con through conversations? and lending our information expertise to help meet these needs. And depending on your type of organization, those needs vary. And these are just a few examples to give you ideas. As we know, no one liaison can do it all. There's subject expertise. I might be an expert in several languages. You might be an expert in computer programming. You might be an expert in math and so forth. Someone else might be an expert in web design or someone might be an expert in analytics from the library system and assessing how the collections are used. So there are subject expertise and functional expertise and there could be some new collaborations. So if I'm the language expert. I could work with a computer programmer to design a, an interactive tool to say, to help lead a student if you are looking for materials about this language and body of literature from this part of the world, go here. Maybe design a quiz to help a student think through the process of where to go. Just one example. The, the ideas are endless depending on your environment. Something else that's really tempting, and I myself have fallen into this trap, is to make very deeply involved online research guides that really are difficult to scale up if you're responsible for a lot of areas. So what would be an efficient way? Could you leverage some of your colleagues' expertise of concentrate by, for example, you concentrate on your own material. I might focus on where are the materials for these particular languages, and I might partner with other colleagues who are experts in other library knowledge, for example, how to do a search how to do interlibrary loan, how to choose a database, and then I might just bring that into my research guide by pointing to it instead of recreating it myself. And then that way the functional experts could feel that they have a sense of contributing to the overall end product. And I feel that 
my time is enough to devote to the intellectual facets of that subject matter that I'm responsible for linking the students with. And there's not one size fits all. Something else that was a big gripe at the Institute was that there's a focus on inputs, which is rooted in the old way of working outward from this is my job description, I do X, Y, Z out of my checklist of tasks, instead of looking at what do we need to achieve. And how many of you collect statistics about numbers of sessions taught? Yep. Numbers of books ordered, number of, number of contacts made, mm -hmm. I hear some yeses. And it gives us a part, but it's only one side of the coin. But just because I'm making contact with a faculty member, I might check, make a check mark, yes, I've made one contact, but what if that faculty member was preparing for an in-depth exam and didn't really have time for an in-depth conversation? Does that count? Well, I would say if I'm looking at this from an outcomes-based perspective, probably not, because if there's no time for a conversation, then there's no opportunity to communicate what that faculty member really needs. Since there's so much struggle and tension between these inputs and outputs, one, one step is to define what are we trying to achieve? And how do we track progress? If, let's say, the language department needs some intellectual support, both, both for collection development maybe buying books in contemporary literature in a certain region of the world. And I'll use Francophone as an example because there's so many French-speaking regions of the world. And without being familiar with that, it's really easy to miss a region. And it could be easy to miss an author that the French program might benefit from, for example. And how would I track pro progress? What's the goal? and how would I track progress? And then also look at what is the university looking to achieve? What are academic success measures? What are the departments? What are the expectations of the academic departments? What do they need to accomplish? How can the library help? And keep having conversations. What about research support? If we're in a research institution and the researchers have struggles with finding data sets for their projects or finding background research, libraries have a role. It all goes back to being a strategic partner. And for some, that comes more naturally than others who have been in an environment that approaches the work from a job prescription standpoint. And some organizations are more rooted in, OK, you have to order this many books. By this date, you have to use x percent of your budget. You have to order for x percentage of your responsibilities of subject matter, or you have to teach X number of classes by this time point in the semester. That's one way. And if an organization is rooted in that tradition, then it could be a challenge to shift to saying, well, we want to make sure that we know what the departments need. We want to make sure we know what the campus needs and have some open-ended conversations about how to make that happen. And there is no one right answer. And if you line up 10 institutions, you get 10 different answers about what might work. And there's no right or wrong way about making that shift.
in the exercises and small group discussions at the Institute, there was a lot of talk about eliminating tasks that just add work and statistics taking and old task mechanics. And some people were really railing against vendor cards. They didn't want to deal with vendor cards. Other people just were frustrated with the input-oriented approach. So the common theme was anything that was task, time consuming and low return. And things to start doing more of were the more conceptual explorations of what do your customers need? And how do you make your support sustainable? Can you leverage online tools and embrace marketing and outreach? There's nothing that says that the librarian can't approach a department and just ask them, what do you need? And see what people say, look for patterns and family of needs to emerge. And the common themes there were looking for a strategy, think long term, and look for impact. Make sure that's something you can do and make sure it's sustainable. There was also some discussion about assessing these evolving liaison roles. Measures of numbers of books ordered really aren't enough. And so there has to be more comfort level with celebrating small victories. So for example, if a liaison is coming into the organization new, and maybe that department hasn't had a dedicated liaison for a while for whatever reason. Maybe the librarians there didn't have the language background to help that language department, for example. So if the, if the idea of a routine liaison relationship hasn't been in place, then the new person is starting from scratch, essentially. So how realistic would it be to say, you have to talk to every faculty member by this amount of time and order X number of books by this amount of time? It's much more, it makes much more sense to celebrate the victories of the person going to that department, either by email or inviting them to lunch or going to a department meeting or an executive committee meeting, depending on how that department is structured, individual meetings, maybe talking to a class of students, and just seeing what they need and building out in the liaison's mind's eye of what are they trying to achieve in the department and what does the library need to do? What are the collection strengths? And how do we teach students how to use what we already have? And how do we bring in what we don't yet have that's a need to teach that language, for example? And this can be formal information, and it can be informal. Sometimes you run into somebody at a faculty meeting in the hallway and say, oh, we're going to start teaching this new language in the fall. And so if you're building that relationship, that's a victory worth celebrating, even though there's no measurable, as in I talked to X number of faculty member in this amount of time, that's something to assess. And administrators can also help by being aware of the fact that the new liaison is starting from scratch, or if it's a long established liaison looking for a new approach, that that is something <coughs> worth celebrating, trying something new as the needs evolve. Especially for administrators, it's important to be clear and let faculty, to let the library liaison know that it's okay if you don't know all the answers at first, and it's okay if you don't order X number of books in this amount of time, if you're doing the other work of talking to people in the department just to get a sense of what they really need. And it's also important to give support to the person who's being a liaison and support them. Don't give inconsistent instructions. Don't say one day, you have to order this number of books, and the next day say, well, yesterday I said this, 
Today, it doesn't really matter how many books you order. It's more important to go out and talk to the department. And don't use bad data. Don't rely on, say, five years worth of ordering data in languages that were taught 10 years ago, when now the department teaches five more languages. Well, those data aren't very meaningful in that context. One thing that really struck me is that everyone is dealing with similar issues. And even though it was an association of the Southeastern Research Libraries, the libraries vary considerably in sizes and types of institutions they support. And I was really struck by how much everyone grappled with similar issues. And people are uncomfortable with the ambiguity of these shifts of, well, if we're measuring the number of books being ordered is no longer enough, what is enough? How do we know that we're doing the right thing? People don't know. And the biggest takeaway that I got from it was that the most meaningful solutions depend on local conditions. What kind of institution does your library support and what are those needs? And again, you line up 10 libraries, you have 10 different answers of what they need. Then when I came back we, to my home library, we had a workshop and worked through our own exercises of our perceptions of liaison issues. And here is one of the word clouds of what people wanted to see in a good library liaison program. And collaboration and learning mindsets were among the most recurring themes. Now I'm going to do some interactive exercises with you. And I will hand out some job descriptions and I would like to, to have you spend between five and ten minutes looking at these and then working with neighbors to pick those apart and look for things that, are, that there's too much of that's extraneous to the library liaison role, other things that there's not enough of, and then we will also look at core competencies for library liaisons and we will do this via live poll. And so just grab one and it doesn't matter which one. Okay, I'm going to move on to your role. So if you could just say what is your role and choose between the various liaison related roles that most closely relate to what you're doing in your position. And then also please tell us if your organization has a liaison program. So as you were looking at these job descriptions, <clears throat> the first part is what struck you as missing from what important liaison components struck you as missing or not articulated well enough or underrepresented. And this is just free form. No right or wrong answer. I would just like to know your thoughts. Next, we're going to look at some tasks that are really really that don't really belong in a liaison role. So, what's superfluous? So, the next question is more of a reflection exercise. So, based on the research that's already been done on liaisonship and your own look at the components that there should be more of and things that are just too much 
and take focus away from the liaison work. What do you think are core competencies for liaisons? <coughs> and again, there's no right or wrong answer. So now I'll switch gear a little bit. For those of you who have liaison programs, what works well in your liaison program? And there's no right answer or wrong answer, and it could be anything ranging from great relationships with teaching professors or maybe a structure in the library of good, good administrative support. Yeah, mutual respect, that's a great one. And now I'd like you to think about what are some pain points in your liaison programs. So next I'd like you to think about what kind of support do you need for your liaison role, whether you're currently receiving that support or not. And this could range from your boss administrative support, and it could also include the library structure, how it might support your your work, your success in being a liaison. So how can administrators help liaisons? And if you're an administrator and you supervise a liaison, how do you support the liaison who's your direct report? Or how would you like to support your liaison colleague going forward? So what are some key takeaways and ideas that you'll try to take to your home institutions from the session? Or what ideas stand out to you as something you want to try to adopt? What issues have stood out to you in particular? What could be doable to make the liaison work go more smoothly for you? Well, I see some common themes across in two major categories, and one is the interpersonal element of just recognizing and realizing the amount of work that the liaisons are doing, and then structurally having support for the complexity of the work. And one thing that we do in our library when we have new liaisons that are either coming new to our organization or librarians taking on a liaison role that have been with our libraries for a while but not served as liaisons. We have orientation sessions and we, the acquisitions head and the monograph acquisitions department and the electronic department and then I heading up collections meet with the liaisons and we describe in depth some tools and things to look for and what the liaisons need to know, who the vendors are for different resources and how to get to know your department. So we give them some guidelines. Something I'm working on is an online guide that's pulling together documents for liaisons. We have a collection manager's toolbox on a university intranet and so one thing I'm working on is pulling those together on a research guide and the guide they can just get to online and then people will log in as themselves to get to the documents on the internet. So that will free up new liaisons and existing liaisons from hunting around the internet trying to find a document of how do I do X again or which vendor is best again and that will help with the bureaucratic mechanics so that liaisons can have more time to think about their work, the intellectual work. Well, thanks very much for putting the information into the 
live poll, this is going to give me a chance to pull it together and organize it in a way that you can then use and download. And you're also welcome to contact me from the, uh, from the conference attendees list. So if you have any follow-up questions, please feel free to ask. And, and I'll be happy to give you more in-depth information and follow up if you need something more in-depth. But did this give you some ideas to take home and unpack some of these issues? Sometimes it really helps. And I thought, even though it was really silent in the room, I know sometimes if the issues in the organization are sensitive, people don't want to be on camera talking about it. So I thought this would be a safe option to put honest thoughts here and look for common themes because we can all learn from each other. And in my university, we have a quite good system of orienting and our mentoring is good, but that doesn't mean that, there, that we can't learn from others or maybe we've developed a blind spot. So hearing about other pain points that others are facing, we could say, oh yeah, we did see an aspect of that right here at home amongst us. So does this give you some, some structure and hope for moving forward? <laughs> You're laughing, okay. <laughs> All right, why are you laughing? Uh, let's see, why is my laughing? Uh, I, I, I don't see that the structure is there, but lots of ideas. Mm -hmm. Lots of ideas of how to move forward. I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done in, in our area. But I'm excited about it. It's actually nice to hear other people in the same boat. <laughs> I think everybody's in the same boat. Well, I think everybody's in the same boat because the new tasks are so interrelated, and it's so easy for the mixture to just wash over each individual's calendar. And sometimes it becomes a hazard to be more talented and more knowledgeable because people will say, "Oh, this person here knows so much about these five things. Let's just ask that knowledgeable person to do this." And then suddenly that one person has the schedule that several of you have mentioned are totally overworked. So some structure and fairness and training can help alleviate that. It will take time. But thanks very much. I hope you got something. Thanks, thanks for coming. I hope you got something good out of this. I'm going to post the results and the slides are already online and the URL that I'm going to post it to is also on one of the slides and you're welcome to email me if you have any follow-up questions.